Welcome to the 6th Annual Soilcraft Conference. Join us as we listen to world-class speakers in the space of regenerative agriculture, as well as human health. We grow food. Food should nourish us, and often we find that our modern food is laden with unwanted synthetics or void of the minerals and vitamins we need to thrive. We endeavor to host this conference for your inspiration and education. Our calling is to help you produce food that heals people and our planet. Join us in this journey to become better stewards of our bodies and the world we abide in. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. That was really good. Thank you, Dwayne, for feeding our spirits. Our spirits. We're trying to marry all the things together, the spirit, the emotions, the physical. We're going to talk a lot about physical stuff today. Microscopic things that we can't see with our eyes. We've got to have tools. And so that's what we're trying to complete here. Um, the emotional one is when I start crying because it's so powerful. I'll see if I can't shed some real tears for you guys. But um, <clears throat> One note, we do have a cool speaker. We have a really, really cool speaker now. But this afternoon, we have a guy named Matt Powers who has this incredible book for sale at the front desk. We're taking cash. It is for us people that are textually, uh, let's see, it's got a lot, I, as, uh, that's luck. It's got a lot of pictures in it, I promise. There's a lot of pictures in here. <laughs> or is it just a textbook, Matt? Maybe. There's, a lot of pictures. There's a lot of pictures in this thing, I promise. But I'm obviously not finding them. Hey, I, I, I found a photo. Look, a photo to grab. Anyways, really interesting book. Um, they are for sale. So if you'd be interested, go and see the, the lovely lady, that smoking hot blonde. It's my wife over there at the front counter. Uh, her name's Tiffany. So ask her about the book. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, <clears throat> Dr. Thomas. Dykstra is the, I'm just going to read what you guys have, so, but is the, maybe it's for the people in the video, is the laboratory director of his own lab, Dykstra Laboratories in Gainesville, Florida. For 25 years, he has studied bioelectromagnetics, how electromagnetic fields affect life, especially as it relates to insects. He holds entomology degrees from Cornell University, as well as the University of Florida, and has been awarded seven patents with one patent pending. Dr. Dykstra consults for farmers, agricultural companies, tech firms, attorneys, international governments, and insurance agencies. He has visited three continents and presents lectures on diverse topics covering entomology, olfactory, physiology, biophysics, well, these are big words, paramagnetism, neurobiology, and biological antennae. Hey, is that a question? Antennae? Uh, in terms of active research, Dr. Dykstra deciphers, deciphered the insect olfactory code back in 2016 and characterizes chemoreceptors for various medical and agricultural insect pests. He teaches both farmers and agricultural consultants how to raise healthy crops for the families and for profit. So, without further ado, the man, the legend, the myth, the soon-to-be father of an eighth child, Give it up, Dr. Thomas Dyson. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Yes, eighth child. My wife is um, seven months pregnant, so we have two months to go. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, and I'm sure you're not, especially if you're married and you had kids, the stage where the woman is uncomfortable has been reached. We are now at that point right now. So because of that, um, it's difficult. It, it, it actually would be difficult sometimes to sleep because there's a lot of rolling around, you know, trying to get this and trying to get that. And she tells me before I leave, she goes, oh, you know, I'm really going to miss you. It's really difficult for me to sleep um, uh, when you're not there. I slept like a baby upstairs. <laughs> I had 
I had no one next to me. I had no kids jumping in the bed. So it was kind of nice. Now, is this being recorded? Yeah, later. Oh, man. Yeah. All right. Lost opportunity right there. All right. All right. You are all mostly, maybe, farmers. Okay. I am a scientist. What this means, I heard that. What this means is that you are going to have to get some information downloaded from me. My job is to hit you hard. It's to hit you between the eyes because I want to make sure that you remember what I say. I am going to bring up some controversial things. I am going to be saying some things that you've never heard of before, but I want to make sure that you pick this up and therefore I'm going to have to hit hard. So this is not going to be a, uh, a casual, soft talk presentation where I kind of woo you to sleep. Now, some of you may take a quick nap. Maybe that's because you're tired because your wife is pregnant too, and it's difficult to get to sleep. I don't know. But right now, I've got some time right now to present. Now, this presentation is going to be a little bit more scientific than even the other presentations that I have. I've got one tomorrow, and I've also got one on um, Thursday, uh, all three are in the morning. So these pr presentations will obviously all encompass science to some degree, but we're gonna be reaching into uh, a little bit deeper science on this because I'm going to be revealing things to you that you've never known, not just about aphids, but about specifically the soybean aphid. And I'm going to have some information that I'm, I'm sure most of you have never seen before. So I'm going to have some spectrums, and I'm going to explain them to you so that you understand exactly what aphids are doing and specifically what the soybean aphid, which is the main focus of this talk. So taste in aphids, it's a chemoreceptive protein analysis. It's a complicated term that you don't need to know too much of the details. I am going to briefly move you into it. But right now, I need to begin with a few other things. I need to give you some background, especially if this is your first time at the Soilcraft uh, conference. All right. Insects only feed upon food that is considered unfit, nutritionally poor, dead, or dying. If you have never heard this before, you've probably never seen any one of my presentations. You must understand that insects are not our enemies. You also must understand, and I'm sure you all understand too, that they're not necessarily our friends. But as far as them being enemies, no. They are there for a reason. They are there to remove plant life that is not supposed to be there, that is not supposed to be eaten by us. And because of that, they have a job. They are designed to do exactly what they are supposed to do and no more. This is uh, one of the, the many truths which will pervade the presentations that I have, presentations that I've given in the past. So insects prefer broken proteins, just to, to describe this a little bit more for those of you who are not buying the words that were above it. They like broken proteins and or partially digested proteins. That's what they like. That's not what you and I like. We like a well-formed protein good tasting food, good flavor, all of the things that go along with this. Insects do not. They are spending their time eating broken food, easily digestible food. They also prefer the simple sugars over the more complex sugars. That's also another thing. So they are preferring also broken down sugars rather than the polysaccharides or some of the things that are not digestible by them. They also prefer the fatty acids over the high carbon lipids and fats, which are usually running 18 to 20 carbons at a minimum, and they keep going up from there and can reach easily 50 carbons, big fatty molecules. They prefer the small stuff. This is what's digestible. This is how they act. This is what they do. Like it or not, we all find ourselves in situations where our crop or animals encounter a pest or disease. Even if we have a holistic plan in place, there are times when we need an intervention. At least in the meantime, while our systems are adjusting to new paradigms and management. At Soilcraft, we have natural and organic solutions to many pests. 
We have essential oils and compounds that are naturally suppress pests and bolster crop and animal health at the same time. It's a relief to know there are other means to deal with pests and disease than toxic chemicals. Reach out and learn more about the proven methods we have that are healthier for everyone on the farm. Call, email, connect. We can help. This is the chart many of you have seen before in the past. If you haven't seen the chart before, I'm gonna review it for you right now. This is a leaf bricks chart. So you take a leaf, you crush it, and you pull out the liquid that you get. You may need more than one leaf. You may need two, you may need five, you may need 10. Squash them, maybe in a garlic press. Get a few drops, only need two to three. Put it on a Brooks refractometer, get a measurement. You now have a measurement of the total dissolved solids in that leaf. And the vast majority of total dissolved solids is sugar. Therefore, by default, we sometimes say this is a measure of sugar. I understand it's total dissolved solids, but you must understand as a farmer that what we are looking for is sugar because that's the majority of the measurement. Why? Why are we measuring sugar? We're measuring sugar because this is the end product of photosynthesis. This is what plants are designed to do. I gave you a little bit of a window into what insects are designed to do, and you know that plants are designed to photosynthesize, and the end product of that is glucose. It's a sugar. Therefore, if we have a way of measuring the sugar that is found inside a plant, we can actually tell whether or not it's healthy or not. One to two, not that healthy. That's not a very healthy plant. As a matter of fact, those plants usually get picked off and die. They can die in as little as a week, sometimes in a few days. When we move to three to seven, things start to improve a little bit. When we get to eight to 12, we're starting to develop some insect resistance at this point because there's enough photosynthesis going on. There's enough biochemical metabolism going on inside the plant that it's actually starting to exhibit some signs of health. By the time we get to 12, 13, 14 and above, there are no insects. There's no disease because insects are pretty much gone between 12 to 14. Uh, fungus is usually gone at about 10 bricks. So if you're putting on fungicides at 10 bricks, you're wasting your money. If it's at 11 bricks, you're still wasting your money. If it's at nine bricks, uh, you might have a few issues, but the plants are usually doing pretty well. By the time we get below six bricks, Fungus is gonna be attacking your plant like there is no tomorrow. Insects will be attacking it, but there are different insects that attack. The chart that I have underneath this superimposes some insect groups onto the BRICS chart. And obviously, I'll be talking about the aphids, so I wanna make sure that you all understand this. Let me start with the last one first, the grasshopper group. At 10 to 12 BRICS, they lose interest in the plant. The grasshoppers, the katydids, longhorn grasshoppers, uh, crickets, things of that sort. They're pretty tough. Mantids too. They can go ahead and use higher quality food than the rest of the other insects. Other chewing insects such as the lepidoptera, the butterflies and the moss, the coleoptera, the beetles feeding upon your roots. Those are the ones that lose interest in a plant when we are between nine to 11 bricks. They're gone at that point. By the time we go to sucking insects, what are, what are these? Leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, frog hoppers, uh, stink bugs, um, uh, the lantern flies. All of these insects lose interest at a plant at seven to nine bricks. And by the time we get down to aphids, which is the aphid group, the aphid group includes aphids, it includes scales, it includes phylloxerins, it includes some of those other lower, lower level insects. They lose interest in a plant when it's at six to eight bricks, okay? So these are the lowest level scum of the earth, insects, and they're going after the worst plants that are out there. So I wanna make sure that you see this. I also wanna point out the plant secondary metabolites increase at what? right at about six bricks. The plant's secondary metabolites, these are metabolites made by the plant, usually in very low quantities, nothing like the sugar that we're measuring. 
uh, the flavonoids, the terpenes, the glucosinolates, all in very, very low levels compared to some of the other things that we measure, such as sugar. What these are doing is they are repelling insects, and they also add taste and flavor and color to a plant. So when we look at a plant, we often judge it when we're in the grocery store. What is its color? Does it have an odor to it? And if it does, we know that we are now above six bricks. What does this mean, Tom? Are you trying to tell us that something below six bricks tastes like cardboard? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. For those of you who have had stuff that tastes like cardboard, that is being passed off as a fruit or a vegetable, you know that it's gonna be in the five bricks or lower range. And so this is a chart that sets a little bit of the tone for where I'm gonna be going because I need to focus on the aphids uh, specifically in this presentation. So I wanna give you a little bit more background as to what they're doing. And part of the reason why the insects, uh, the aphids, are so different from the others is because they can't handle all of the uh, 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 nutrients, so to speak, that they are feeding upon in the phloem tissue. So they have a bypass mechanism. This bypass mechanism is right there. So food, when it goes through a grasshopper, goes in a unidirectional matter. In the mouth, out the anus, one direction. Aphids have two directions. It can pass here through and then continue to pass all the way to the anus. However, there's a region here with four blue arrows. It's a bypass mechanism. This bypass mechanism enables the aphids in order to shunt sugar and water out the back end before it ever gets inside the aphid. Because if too much gets in, which is hard to do because uh, the plants that it's feeding upon are usually very low bricks, uh, they are going to uh, die. They cannot continue to eat. If the bricks is too high, they take a sip, just like you do. If you have a drink that's too strong, you'll take a sip. You're not gonna take an entire bottle of, let's say, vodka and put the whole thing down in 30 seconds. It will either kill you or you will pass out under those circumstances. Same thing happens with an aphid. If it's too strong, too much, it takes a sip. But if they're enjoying what they're getting, they can remain there for 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours doing nothing but sitting on the plant and sucking the juices. And they are able to do that in part because they have this bypass mechanism, which other insects do, do not. So this is the homopteran filter chamber. It is found in other homopterous insects, leafhoppers included. Uh, but the aphids um, uh, are going to be the focus. So these are some of the heavyweights. We have 5,000, over 5,000 species of aphids in the world. It's a lot. Can't talk about all of them. You don't want me to talk about all of them. But we do have some heavyweights that are up here. These are the ones that some of you may be familiar with. So we have the black bean aphid, the pea aphid, the soybean aphid, the corn leaf aphid. Uh, so we've got these insects here that are relatively well known based upon the crop. I'm not even going to talk about, certainly not talking about 5,000, I'm not even going to talk about 10 of them. We're so glad you enjoyed this installment from our in-person conference. We want this to reach as many people as possible, so we've decided to release this free to you bit by bit every month. But imagine how awesome it would be in person. The networking questions and discussions that result are equally as valuable. Join us next year in person for our 2026 conference. Your presence makes the experience. If you have any questions or needs, please reach out. Call, email, follow. We can help.